welcome to 30 Flirty and Nerdy. Today I have one of my best friend's father on the show with me today, Richard Carson. I am so excited because he is just a wonderful man who has so many amazing stories and times that he had when he was in his 30s. He was living in New York with the hustle and bustle of everything going on and just living that life. And I'm really excited today because today is kind of a chill story time type of day and for you all to get to know my best friend's father. Hi, Richard. Thank you so much for being on the show. Hi there. It's a pleasure and I'm happy to uh, take part in today's discussion. Yeah. So if you will like to tell the listeners who don't know who you are a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and just kind of an overall who Richard is. Okay, so I won't go back too far because I'm pretty old now. So, you know, you don't want to be here for an hour and a half. So we'll make it as short as we possibly can. But in, in uh, the short version is I was born in Brooklyn, New York. My father was working at the Copacabana at the time. My mother was a Copa girl. And I ended up moving quite a few places around the country, including Santa Fe. My father and my mother divorced. My father came out to Vegas. I lived with my mother. She was quite an extravagant woman, to say the least. And so I ended up having a, a lot of interesting, let's just say, experiences, you know, being brought up. But as far as myself, yeah, I uh, obviously, I went to school. I went to uh, Boston University. I went to State University of New York. And uh, when I got out of school, I didn't know what to, what to do. So I sort of went into the family business for a few years which is basically the hotel business. My father was a casino manager out here in Vegas, built the uh, King's Castle up in Lake Tahoe with his partner, Nate Jacobson. And uh, consequently, I was sort of thrown into the fray, so to speak, and had some quite interesting, fun experiences. You don't really even think about it until you're older and you realize some of the things you did, because as you're going through it, as you know, it's sort of a little bit of oblivious. But anyway, that's the short story, young lady. So what else? <laughs> Thank you. Uh -huh. Well, what are some of the fun experiences that you had that you're kind of like thrown into like, oh, shit, what did I get myself into? I don't understand what's happening here. How do I get myself out of this pickle? <laughs> Oh, there's been plenty of those, plenty of those. When, frankly, in terms of stories, I've got a, a, an interesting one that maybe you don't know some of the names because you're much younger, but when I was working at the Walt Astoria, we used to have most of the powers to be staying in the Waldorf Towers. And at one time, Menachem Begin, who, as you might know, is head of the PLO, and the Israeli prime minister were staying in the, in the hotel at the same time. So we had to make sure that they never, ever met, frankly, or ran into each other. So we were continuously uh, monitoring the elevators with Secret Service and, you know, lots of interesting things. I, I took care of when any president stayed at the property, I used to take care of all the preliminary sort of things that were required on so many levels when a president comes and stays. So I'd work with the Secret Service and the hotel to prep for his arrival. And consequently, I met a lot of a lot of different interesting people during my stay there. So you worked with a lot of kind of famous, popular, like, like what you're saying, like the princes trying to keep them apart from each other. Like just, you were kind of like the go-to guy, right? Like people kind of went to you for like help in some way and kind of like help get set up and like right. everything like that. Right. I was the, I was the, uh, well, I was the assistant to the GM, very famous guy named Gene Scanlon. And I was very young at the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it was quite interesting because basically my job was to either represent Gene when he wasn't available and, or give him, you know, various different reports on, you know, all the aspects of the hotel. And as you can imagine, the Waldorf is a crazy place, but as I said, I grew up in the business. My father had me working as a night bellman when I was about 13 years old, when I went to visit him in Kings at the King's Castle in Lake Tahoe. So I really understood, you know, the back of the house, the front of the house, the whole nine yards. And so, you know, when I came out of school, I started, I started training thoroughbred horses for a little while at Aqueduct in Belmont. And then I, I decided I, I didn't want to do that anymore. And I got into the hotel business because I knew it. From there, it led me to lots of different, very, very interesting places by the people I met. 
what would be the most interesting place that you visited and the most interesting person that you met when you were in your 30s and, and that like you think about to this day and you're like oh that was such a cool experience well you know you run across so many unique people that stay at the waldorf you name it i met them from basically tom jones from the entertainment sector to the kid who was choking i'm trying to remember his name now in dallas he almost died well he did die he was dating the the actress that was on dallas Kurt you Cobain? Know, no not Cobain. no oh. it'll come back to me in a minute but that was a very interesting time wow. you know, i've met virtually almost oh probably 30 40 different presidents while i was there from all over the world not i'm not obviously not <laughs> not the u.s i'd be a lot older than i am but just very, very unique, different people. Because when when the UN's in session, basically, like I said, a lot of the heads of state and other diplomats uh, stay in the towers. So it was it's a certain part of the Waldorf Astoria, which is completely set. Although it's a, a part of the entire block, but it's a separate with its own separate elevators and and very good security. The reason the president stayed there is because they had what's called the well. They could, he could drive down, he could drive in between into the building and nobody potentially could, could fire at him or when he was getting out of the car. So it was a very, very secure place to live. I'll, I have a very interesting story. I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure how many people are going to be seeing this. I don't know why I want all of this information out there, <laughs> but so it's hard. I got to be sort of hard. It's difficult to, to, to say what I should say and what I shouldn't say, but lots of stories, lots of stories all over the place. If it's stories you want, I'll give you a, another. I, uh, I got a call from, from the credit department and they said to me, hey, listen, there's a really great guy. I mean, when, by that, they mean a good client who stayed at the property many, many times over the last several years. And his name's Chester Gray, and he owes us a lot of money. And could, they, one of my responsibilities was, was to basically take care of all VIP guests, and he was considered a very VIP guest. So <clears throat> I said, okay, give me his, his, his uh, suite number and I'll give him a call. Ended up walking, going up to his suite. He invited me up to his, his suite and we got to know each other. And he's an incredibly fascinating guy who, an old timer back then, we're talking in the early 80s, he was in his 60s. So, but he had known just about anybody and everybody from Che Guevara to you name it. I actually ended up quitting my job at, at the Waldorf when I met him and eventually did a business deal with him in Europe that led me to live in London for a few years and other parts. So, but all things sort of lead back to the, to my days at the Waldorf, which wasn't, I didn't stay there very long. I was only there for two years. So it wasn't a, a long stay. i worked at the Plaza Hotel before that, mm -hmm. worked at the Shoreham Hotel in Washington, D.C., and then I left, I finished, I finished at the Waldorf. I went to Europe and that was then a whole nother chapter of my life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when you went to Europe too, that's where you met Yolanda as well in Europe? I did, or, I, yeah. did. I did. Mm -hmm. I met her on a, I met her as I, I, I may have told you the story. I don't know. No, I don't want to be repetitive. No. You don't know. I don't oh. think I know the story no. actually. Mm -mm. Well, For I, those I, that don't know, Yolanda is Chanel's mom. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I met Yolanda on a port on a balcony overlooking the Thames River at about four o'clock in the morning at a very good friend's apartment, mm -hmm. and um, I had actually gone to the uh, to the party with two girls, <laughs> one on either arm, <laughs> and it was a great party, fantastic party. And we, it was, it was very late. I don't even know why. I can't really remember, but I walked out onto this balcony and I saw this unbelievably gorgeous woman. Mm. And I mean, I, I've, I've obviously, I've, I've met lots of gorgeous women, but all too often when gorgeous women, you know, interact, it's, there's nothing there. Right. Mm -hmm. But we hit it off. Like you wouldn't believe I went up to her. I started, you know, chatting her up a little bit. Cause I couldn't believe, I just, want, I had to say hello. I just had to say hello. Yeah. Anyway, we got along famously. We had a really great conversation about, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 minutes later, 
the two girls that I came to come to the party with came out and they're like, well, there you are. We're it's late. Come on. We got to go. And I was like, I'll be right there. I told her I'll be right, I'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. And I, I escorted the girls. I was trying to get them a, a black cab. And, and then I was just going to say, good night. I'm going to stay. I've got some other things to do, <laughs> but they weren't having it. They, they knew something was up and they said, no, 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 no. You came with us. You're going with us. So anyway, I called the <laughs> next day. I, I called a friend of mine who threw the party and I said, Jeremy, this that girl's amazing. I got to have her number. Mm -hmm. Ozzy, stop. So, so what happened in, in essence, she had already called my friend and said, Hey, who's that guy? I'd like to invite him to a little tea party I'm having and uh, I said oh that's great I said I couldn't go though because I was actually I was leaving to go out of the country for a board meeting I had and I and so we didn't really get to see each other oh I can't remember two or three weeks because she was going somewhere she was actually going to go stay with some very very interesting people she knew she knew a lot of people in the uh, Formula One racing circuit and and i i met so many wonderful people through through her it's just amazing but anyway basically when she got back to her apartment which was called man trap by the way <laughs> so that ought to tell you that's something. really funny <laughs> <laughs> there were three dozen roses that were waiting for her so and uh, the rest is history we ended up we couldn't we just couldn't uh separate until uh, obviously you know what happened so I don't yeah. Even, yeah. So anyway, that's that was that was my beginning stages in London. You know what they say about Americans in London, right? Mm, um, maybe they say over here, overpaid, and oversexed. <laughs> <laughs> I have never heard of that before, but that's funny. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. London back then was a completely different town. It was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was, it was um, let's just say a lot of fun with a lot of interesting things going on. I was lucky because my old man uh, knew the owner of a place called Tramps, uh, which is a very sort of private exclusive club in London. And I was looking for a place to hang out. I was a, you know, a new American. I didn't know anybody really. I didn't, you know, I didn't get the, uh, I didn't really know London at all. But I mm -hmm. did know that Tramps and there was another place called Annabelle's was a place to go if they wanted to see or do anything. Uh, and I was very lucky because the guy who owned uh, Tramps uh, knew my father uh, out of Vegas. So I got, I was able to, you know, cut the line and uh, and and become a member. And that was just the best because, of course, you name it, everybody who's anybody uh, went to trams from the Stones to Michael Caine to... Wow. It, it, was, it was owned by a uh, part owner was, um, was uh, the woman author who writes all of the... Uh, you have to look her up. She, uh, I'll try... My, my, my memory's fading, but... She's a very famous author. Uh, she, her husband owned part of it with Michael Caine, Johnny Gold, some very interesting people. And they had this very famous club called Tramps. There's a book out, by the way, if you really want to. That's where everybody met everybody. So oh, I, was wow. there. I was there every single night. I mean, literally every single night because it had a little dining room. You could you could eat, you could dance, mm -hmm. you could. And it was very tiny, 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 tiny club. In fact, uh, Yolanda, while while she was there, uh, when she came to London, she got to uh, she got into the the club. I don't even know how, but she mm -hmm. got in. And, and Harry Seltzman of um, uh, you know the James Bond movie producer saw oh, wow. saw her in the club. Asked somebody to come on over that he'd like to talk to her. And of course, she didn't know who he was, and she wasn't the type of girl who was just going to get up and walk over to somebody anyway. So, mm -hmm. you know, she told Guido, who was a great waiter there, he was there forever. He said, "Listen, I I don't do that." He said, "If if he wants to meet with you know meet me, by all means, have him come over and say hello." So he came over and introduced himself and said, "Listen, I'd like you to to test uh, to be a Bond girl." <laughs> oh my gosh, that's crazy! <laughs> yeah, so. So at the end of the day, uh, she did, she did the test. Uh, she did the test. Her Dutch accent was too strong at the time because she had just 
virtually arrived in London only a, you know a few weeks before. So uh, she didn't get the part, but um, it didn't really matter. It's just a, a fun, a funny little story. That's all, nothing much, nothing more. That's an um, amazing story. <laughs> yeah, I got lots. I just, you know, it's one, I, I didn't really prepare for this discussion because I could That's have okay. just gone through, a, you know, uh, a whole list here for you. But I had quite an interesting life. If I was a better writer, I'd love to write a book. All my good friends say, Jesus, Richard, you've got to write a book with all the crap yeah. you've done. And I said, I first of all, I can't <laughs> I can't really divulge too much of it. Um, <laughs> otherwise I get myself into trouble. But uh, you know, it's it's um and I'm not a I'm not a good writer. Otherwise, I would have loved to. I, I I'm not a good recontour. David Niven, you should you should read David Niven's book. He was another famous mm -hmm. actor. He's a recontour. He can sit here and tell you stories all day long and beautifully, eloquently. It's just never been my my gig, so to say. Mm -hmm. Well, you're doing a great job so far. I'm loving hearing your stories. Stories. What kind of stories you want? You want with movie stars, mm -hmm. actresses, hotel stories, politicians. Oh my uh you, you have, really know everyone <laughs> it's not no it's not really even that it's uh, more exposed i mean i've been exposed mm. to so many things because i was thrown into various uh let's just say um really varied types of situations that i was fortunate my mother was incredibly eccentric she was also very beautiful. She was a, a top fashion model on the cover of Vogue, Harper's, you know. She she worked as a, she was a Copa girl as well. And yeah. uh, after she had, uh, she had my, my sister, uh, my half sister, and she got pregnant very young in her life. She's an amazing, amazing woman. My mother was probably mm -hmm. stronger than any guy I've ever met in my entire life, to be honest with you. Yeah. And I thank God yeah. that I, I grew up with her and not my old man, because my old man was a gambler, uh, very successful gambler, not the typical, you know, broke bet type of things, very successful guy. But if you know the gambler's mind, they're very self-centered. You know, my mother was so giving. She gave all of her kids. She took us everywhere. We ended up as kids going to Europe and living there when I was uh, wow. 11 and a half, 12 years old. So yeah. she took us all over the world. She took us... Um, you know, one day we'd be broke. The next day we'd have a few bucks. Uh, we had a lot of adventures as kids. So yeah. it, sort of, it, it set me up. As I got older, I felt very comfortable going anywhere. Uh, going anywhere. And... But that's really fun because you were able to experience that as a kid. So when you moved to uh, Europe yourself, you were able to kind of know your way around a little bit, right? That's exactly right. You know, you just made you, if you, you kind of do it and, and experience it as a kid, uh, it doesn't scare you. And you know what uh, Churchill or Roosevelt, I can't remember who said it, but there's nothing to fear but fear itself. You kind of learn that, right? So, you know, I just, it set me up for having a very interesting life. I'm really, really, you know, I, I'm fulfilled. If I, if I check out tomorrow, I've had a wonderful time. Lots of fun. Lots of troubles too. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> lots of troubles. <laughs> Lots of aggravation, lots of everything, but uh, at least it hasn't been boring. That's for damn sure. No, that's good. That's good. And so guess one of my last questions for you, since we're kind of running in towards time, is yeah. if you could give yourself advice to your 30-year-old self, what advice would you give? I about, would, being 30? <laughs> about being 30? About yes, being 30? About being 30. Because thirty is a really interesting age. You're coming; yeah. it's coming out of being able to do whatever, whenever, however you want. To basically getting more serious, right? Me, myself, and I—I I didn't even start getting serious until I was in my fifties. But <laughs> most people, you're supposed to really in your thirties at least start having a direction of some sort that you want to get into or or be successful at or whatever. I would say to those people in their 30s, if they don't have a direction yet, don't panic. That's what I would say, because life is a journey and there's a lot of twists and turns. If I could give somebody in their 30s some advice though, 
I'd say do something with a bit of foundation that you can count on. Try and find a little niche that you can make some money. You don't have to be committed to anything. It'll sort of, most people who aren't professionals, and by that lawyers, doctors, whatever, they're going to, they're basically know what they're doing since their early 20s, right? But when you're 30 and you're sort of still in that quagmire, bit of a quagmire, people can get very apprehensive. Like, where am I going? What am I doing? I've got to do something. And I would say to them, relax. Don't be, you know, lazy, but, you know, there's so many twists and turns in this life and I've, I've lived it, breathed it. It's, it's there for a reason. It's everybody has to go through their sort of own little journey. And that's what it is. It's just a journey. Thank you so much for that advice. I know people in my age right now are kind of like, I need to be successful. I need to do this. I need to like, they start to feel like they're not successful or they, they don't have something like a foundation, like you're saying, and you do become more serious. And that's where I'm starting to feel myself is I'm starting to kind of get my financials in order. I'm starting to get my business in order a little bit better, you know, working more time and just kind of like getting every part of my life in order. Mm -hmm. And I feel like your 20s is supposed to be messy, as my cousin mentioned in like a previous episode. And now is the time, like you said, you're just kind of figuring out life and being more serious. And I love that you said, have a, have a niche, have a, have something like that you could grow kind of like on the side type of thing. Cause a lot of times that can end up becoming something you do full time, which is really cool. Yeah. So thank you so much for that advice. No, you're absolutely, you're welcome. I, you know, I, I also though, it, 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 you have to have, don't take life so seriously. Mm -hmm. That's really, so many people take life so seriously and because they're exposed to so much more in this day and age than yeah. I was when I was a kid. Everybody's getting almost hyper, hypersensitive to being serious and Life's, life's got to be about having fun and just enjoying your friends, enjoying good times. And it can't be just about getting somewhere or being somebody or whatever. That's not what life's supposed to mean. So. Wise words from Richard. <laughs> there you go. If, if I have any, those, <laughs> those would be them. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so, so much for being a guest today and for your time and just for your stories. I'm sure people are going to just enjoy hearing what life was like <laughs> for you. <laughs> Take care. Thank nice you so to much. see you. Hey friends, thank you for listening to today's episode. Please take a moment to follow and review this podcast so it can reach others. Also, if you leave a review, I'll be sharing your review in the next episode. Lastly, if you want to be part of this growing podcast to chat about your life, your profession, passions, or if you have advice that you wish you had at 30, please sign up at the link provided in the show notes. I would love to have you as a guest on the show. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you have a wonderful day.